Good morning on this chilly May morning. Today we're looking at uh, Psalm 11. Uh, as we read through this psalm, you notice in the first verse that David starts by declaring where he takes refuge, uh, particularly in times of trouble. Uh, and he's anticipating the natural reaction, uh, which is, how can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to the mountain? You know, when, when we're under attack by evil people, we tend to just want to escape, right? We want a way out. We just want the pain to stop. And David says, you know, I'm not seeking to escape. I'm seeking the Lord when I'm in trouble, <clears throat> when I'm dealing with, uh, with difficulty. Now, David, many times, uh, he would run away when he was under physical attack. And in fact, the Lord Jesus said, if they start killing you in the city, in this city, run away and go to another one. So he's not necessarily talking about, uh, you know, escape from physical danger, although certainly, um, you know, it, it could include something like that. Uh, he's really primarily talking about where do you, where does your soul go when you're under attack? That's really what he's talking about. Uh, certainly, when you're endangered physically, your soul can feel uh, quite troubled as well. But where do you go for your soul? Uh, where is your refuge for your soul in a time of crisis? David says, I go to the Lord rather than relying on changing my environment uh, by you know, getting distracted by something else or binging on Netflix. I rely on the Lord. That's, what I go, that's where I go to. That's who I go to uh, when my soul needs refuge in a time of uh, trial and, and crisis. And David is anticipating here actually a very huge crisis situation, a very huge uh, problem situation. <clears throat> In verse 3, he asks the question, you know, where do the righteous go if the foundations are destroyed? You know, what can the righteous do if the foundations are destroyed? Uh, now, this word for foundations is actually the same word that's used for pillars <clears throat> in uh, Isaiah 19.10. And the implication is it's really suggesting the people who provide the foundation in society and, and provide stability in society, namely people who, who we go to to seek justice when there's a problem. What happens when the people you go to to seek justice when there's a problem are the problem? Or what happens if the people you go to to seek justice are, are just either not there or are, are simply... Uh, you know, corrupt, and they're not going to help you. Uh, David knew all about this. I mean, David's running from Saul. He can't very well go to the police or to the government for help. Saul is the head of the government. Uh, I mean, they're not going to help him. They're going to help Saul. And so uh, David knew exactly what this felt like to be in a situation where the people you look to uh, for justice are the problem. What do you do if that's the situation? And so David really talks about that. And he says here in verse 4, one of the ways that he would make the Lord a refuge for his soul is he would get a realistic picture of the situation and truly understand what's really going on behind the scenes and what is ultimately going to happen. He had to get a proper perspective on the situation. He said that's, that's really how he did it. And, and in verse 4, we see that he says the Lord's throne is in heaven. So God is, is enthroned. He hasn't lost his power or his authority or his ability to do things just because we're in a crisis situation, even though it feels like the wheels are coming off. His eyes see. God knows what's going on. He's very aware of it. Uh, and his eyelids test the children of man. So he's got a true clear picture of the situation he knows who's doing evil he knows who's naughty he knows who's nice and unlike santa claus he's got real power to do something about it so god allows for such situations in people's lives here he says uh, to test them actually in verse four and he gets specific in verse five and he says the lord tests the righteous that might be a, lo a little unnerving but he doesn't tempt us but he does allow us to be tested He's actually doing that to, not only to work our faith muscles, uh, but uh, as we find our refuge for our soul in God and, and we do what he wants, the, the end result is that that test will actually produce tremendous benefit to us. And that's what's really helpful to see. Uh, and he's going to take care of the problem ultimately. Notice what he says in verses 5 through 6. The Lord hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. The Lord will rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind will be their cup. In other words, they're not going to get away with it. As the, as the Lord says in Nahum 1.3, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty, right? 
Paul refers to this in, in Romans 12, verse 17, when he says, repay no one evil for evil. Uh, in verse 19, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And this may very well be part of what he was thinking about. You know, that God will take care of the situation if you let him. Don't take your own vengeance. Leave it to God. Uh, <clears throat> verse 7, God repays the wicked because why? The Lord is righteous. It's the right thing to do, and he's going to do it. And he loves righteous deeds. He loves it when his people take refuge in him and continue to do the right thing. Uh, and the raining of the coal on the wicked suggests uh, recompense in this life. But the raining of fire and sulfur and a scorching wind becoming their portion, like forever, it really implies eternal punishment. And so ultimately, nobody is going to get away with anything. Uh, the Lord loves righteous deed. He notices, he watches what, he, what we're doing. It matters to him when we do the right thing. We're going to be blessed for it. And we're blessed because of our faith in God uh, and our refuge in him. As Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6-7, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what God has for you, my brethren. So be encouraged and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.